body instead is probably many of you that were Jehovah's Witnesses and you sprung yourself loose from the organization and maybe many of you have been there for many years and maybe some for just a few years uh, my wife and I have been in the organization we're out of it now but we were in the organization for 50 years as a matter of fact I grew up you could say as a Jehovah's Witness my mother and all of the relatives on her side of the family are Jehovah's Witnesses even till this day and the interesting thing is my father he never really uh, got attracted to the world of the Jehovah's Witnesses so I grew up in a divided household you could say my mother was so called in the truth and my father wasn't and it was kind of awkward but it was kind of good because I was able to do a few things that strict witness families wouldn't allow their witness children to do uh, my mother didn't like me going to the school dance for example but my father really didn't have a problem with it but uh, in school in high school I met Inez and I was 16 years old at the time and the problem was and I knew it would be a really big problem because she wasn't a Jehovah's Witness but I started to really like her and it was very very awkward because how could I introduce a young woman to my mother who was a strict witness and how could I introduce a woman that wasn't a witness so I had to really toil with that then finally got enough courage up to go and tell my mother that I met a girl in school that I really did like and my mother's first suggestion was well do you think she'll study the Bible does she have a knowledge of God will she like to learn about Jehovah and I'm sure many of you growing up in witness families might, might have encountered a similar thing those are the questions that were asked to you so I said well she seems to be a God fearing person so Inez was willing to study the Bible with uh, my aunt and myself we all studied together and we came in the so called truth as baptized witnesses when we were both very young well, as Rick said, he had talked to his mother and told her that he met a girl in school and she was a little concerned because she wanted to know if I wanted to know anything about God. Well, I was raised in a household with God-fearing parents. My father was Catholic, my mother was Protestant, but they really weren't practicing their religions. But when I was a little girl, wherever we lived, my mother would send us to church. My sister and I came from a large family of six children and I was the youngest. And I went to church one day when I was a little girl and we were given a Bible and it was a King James Bible. And I walked home from church one day and I went in the yard and I had the Bible in my hands. It was a King James Bible. This is the NASB. I held it up in the sky and I said, Dear God, why did you give me a book I can't understand? So I was a God-fearing person. So when Rick's mother found out that I... Um, liked him and he liked me and she wanted to know if I wanted to learn about God I was right for learning about God because I had loved God all my life so that's how easy it was to get studying with Jehovah's Witnesses well Rick and I have been married almost 40 years in fact it will be 40 years in October we have five beautiful children and nine grandchildren and we raised our children also in Jehovah's Witnesses religion because we thought that was the right thing to do we thought that we were learning about God. We didn't realize at the time that it was a cult and how dangerous it was. And had we known that, we would have never had anything to do with it. And we're glad that we're out now. But we still love God. We have two children who are still Jehovah's Witnesses, two daughters and their husbands and a grandson. And they don't speak to us any longer because we are no longer Jehovah's Witnesses. And I have to tell you, being a Jehovah's Witness is not an easy chore. When you witness, you don't realize it. But boy, I will tell you, and you know it as well, that you really are put into fast motion. We were a good Jehovah's Witness family. Uh, having five children, all of us going to the meetings regularly, attending all the assemblies. In fact, even in 1969, they had one of the largest assemblies in New York. And we only had one child at the time, and we went there. It was an eight-day assembly, and they would start at 9 o'clock in the morning and go till 9 o'clock at night. And I have to tell you, even as a Jehovah's Witness, 
I was so happy. When that assembly was over, I got my little car and drove all the way back as fast as I could from New York to Boston, and I was glad that was over because it was really a chore. And all I can really remember, it was hot, there were thunderstorms, I can remember some of the brothers carrying people off that were getting sick on stretches. It was a terrible thing. But nonetheless, there was 120,000 people there, and they endured it because it was Jehovah's organization. But it wasn't easy, especially for even a Jehovah's Witness mother, trying to get all the kids ready mm -hmm. for the meetings and braiding their hair and pressing their clothes and getting them out in service. And uh, Jehovah's Witnesses really do live a very busy life. You know, another thing, too, that makes it very difficult and even a hardship is writing talks as a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, for some, it's very, very difficult, and it really does become burdensome. You know, you have a talk you have to give on a meeting night, and boy, all day long you're thinking about it, all week long you're thinking about it. It's very hard for the children, too, when they're young, because they can't write their own talk, so you as a parent have to kind of write their talk, especially my wife wrote a lot of my children's talks. But uh, no matter what you do in the organization, you can never be doing enough. But we were trying to do enough so that we could live forever as a family, live together in Paradise Earth. But a strange thing took place. A hope was always to live on earth, as the witnesses teach, in their paradise. But in 1989, I can remember my wife came to me one morning and said, Rick, I want to go out to breakfast with you. I have something very important to tell you. Folks, I had no idea what my wife was going to tell me. I put her in the car. I thought maybe she's going to leave me. But I put her in the car, drove down to the restaurant, we had uh, breakfast, and my wife said to me, Rick, I have a very important thing to say. Well, what is it, honey? What is it? She says, Rick, I have to tell you that I now have a hope of living in heaven. Wow, that's an interesting thought, I thought. It was an amazing thing. I, and at first, I'm thinking, well, we were going to live together as a family on paradise earth. But now, all of a sudden, you have the heavenly hope, a member of the 144,000 class. Now at first that created a psychological dilemma. I wasn't mad, I didn't lash out as it was, and I really believed what she was saying was true. But I knew the elders would give her a tough time on that. And did they give you a tough time on this? They certainly did. <laughs> In fact, why don't you mention to what they said? Okay, I went. I wanted to go to the eldest because I was a good Jehovah's Witness, and I told Rick I wanted to go and speak to the presiding overseer and tell him, Richard, Jehovah has anointed me. And he said, Well, you did have mental problems, didn't you, Sister Karen? I said, No, Richard, I didn't have mental problems. I did have a brain hemorrhage um, quite some time before that. And I said, And I'm half blind in both eyes but only physically. I see clearer than ever spiritually. Now after hearing that, you would say, wow, that creates a real dilemma. And it, it did at first, and uh, I, I had to deal with this, but I got thinking, you know, I can only live on one world at a time. So we will take each day and see what progresses along. And then the amazing thing, it was a few years later, in 1993, that all of a sudden my hopes changed from living on earth in paradise to now living in the heavens. And it was a real hope, I have to tell you. God works in miraculous ways. We don't know how God works with his spirit. We really don't. But uh, he got my wife to have a heavenly hope, and now I have a heavenly hope, and now we're attending the Kingdom Hall as part of the 144,000 class. And let me tell you, it wasn't an easy chore. Right off the bat, a lot of the witnesses, most of them, have a negative feel about that. They feel very uncomfortable around people who are telling you they have a heavenly hope. And we would partake of the emblems at the memorial. And that's a very awkward thing. Imagine sitting in 
with a congregation uh, in the memorial, the attendant swells. Imagine 200 people all sitting in a room and they're passing the emblems around and the only ones that would take it are the ones with the heavenly hope. And boy, that is at times kind of intimidating and everyone's looking and gawking at you. But my wife went through it for a few years before I did and then her and I were the only ones that would partake in the whole kingdom hall. And all the different thoughts and expressions that you would hear later about this, it was really enough to make an anointed one get discouraged. But we didn't get discouraged. We kept following the beat of Jehovah's true organization. You might even ask, well, what, what is it then that got you out of the so-called truth? Well, I have to tell you that uh, Inez and I did an awful lot of studying. Uh, for the Watchtower on Sundays, Saturday nights sometimes we'd study four and five hours so that we went into the Watchtower study, we could answer correctly, everything seemed to be just perfect, we wanted to make sure that we were remaining good witnesses. But we found that a lot of the witnesses didn't understand the concept of having a hope of living in heaven. And they began to, as we mentioned earlier, stand off from us. So we started doing more and more examination of the Bible. The teachings of the Watchtower we began to find were a little obscure. They at times even became outright wrong. We noticed the New World Translation was not a good translation as we were told it was a superior translation. It wasn't. We got a parallel Bible and we began to examine what other Bibles were saying on certain scriptures. And we found that what other Bibles were saying is the true Christian way of living, not the NWT. In the Watchtower studies, we would go in and we would comment. And our comments would be very spiritual. For example, if you could make a comment from the book of John, let's say about the Holy Spirit, and you would mention during the Watchtower lesson, as I did, that the Holy Spirit almost takes on a person of its own. Of course, the Watchtower conductor was quite upset over that. He ushered me in the back room afterwards and said that I really shouldn't be talking like that in the Watchtower study. And I said, well, why? What am I saying that's wrong? He said, it's really not wrong what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is confusing the other brothers and sisters. And this got to be a routine. Our comments were being challenged because our comments were coming from the real side of Christianity. And it was very discontenting to be able to be with a group of people that kept challenging you on every single statement that you made. Another thing that we noticed uh, as we started to uh, distance ourselves to some degree, as we started finding the real truth from the Bible, as I got in contact, I tried to find as many so-called anointed ones, members of the 144,000 class as I could. And I would call around the country and I would search out of the assemblies. And I found that most of the people that I contacted, I was able to contact 10 people of that class. And most of them, if not all, were having major difficulties in the organization. They were either being disfellowshipped or brought up on disfellowshipping charges. It seemed as though the outside anointed, those that weren't at Bethel, were being chastised and ridiculed. And this was bothering a number of them. So I made a call to the Watchtower organization and I talked to a member of the governing body about this. And I got to know this man pretty well. I had a number of conversations on the phone with him concerning various issues. In fact, he even asked me to do some research on a, a Revelation scripture, Revelation 7, 2, and 3. But we'll get into that to another time. That's another story. But I did want to say this. When you are a witness, you have to be walking in a way that is totally upright. You have to walk with the watchtower every minute of the day. It becomes challenging. And you find out that they're an evil empire. But when we went down to New York to visit this brother, as he invited us down, we spent a good part of the day there with him. And we mentioned a lot of the concerns that Jehovah's Witnesses of the 144,000 class were having. 
A lot of changes were taking place. This was right around the year 2000. A lot of corporate changes were taking place in the organization. Uh, the new presidents, all of the new presidents of new corporations were not of the anointed class. And now the elders were even beginning to represent the anointed. And there was just something about this whole arrangement that didn't pass the smell test. So on returning home, we began to look more up about the watchtower. In fact, it was an interesting thing. We went to a Christian bookstore and we started getting books all about who the Jehovah's Witnesses were. And wow, it was amazing what we saw in these books. We couldn't believe it. And Inez actually came across a brochure for a convention that they were having down in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Pennsylvania. Joan Setner, who was a witness for many years, runs a convention every October. And we visited that convention. And what a remarkable thing that was. My wife and I began to see that the organization wasn't the God-directed organization that we thought it was. In fact, we now began to see the organization as an evil, authoritarian empire. And many, many lives were being hurt and destroyed by the tactics of the Watchtower. There was one particular article that got my attention and really got me thinking a lot. And that was in 1983, and I want to read a little portion of this to you. This article is a dangerously written article, and it's in the January 15, 1983 Watchtower, and it's on page 22. And it says here to the Watchtower reader, that is Jehovah's Witnesses for the most part, to avoid independent thinking. But there's one sentence in there that really is a terrible thing to suggest to any reader or to say to anybody. It says, how is such independent thinking manifested? See, the Watchtower doesn't want you to think independently. They want to do your thinking. It says a common way that independent thinking is manifested is by questioning the counsel that is provided by God's visible organization. So, in essence, you are not supposed to question anything that comes from the Watchtower. Now, I have to tell you, the Watchtower and the Mafia are very much the same, and I certainly don't mean to disrespect the Mafia. In July of 2005, I was disfellowshipped from the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses in Wilmington, Mass., and uh, I was just fellowshipped for what they call apostasy. And that is actually not following the teachings of the Watchtower organization. And I feel good that I was able to go into that judicial committee hearing and talk to those brothers. They had uh, brothers there that questioned all of my motives. They questioned my belief system. But I brought up to them and I kept saying to them that they have to look in and see what's going on behind the curtains of the Watchtower. The thing is, you can hear the entire Judicial Committee hearing as well as the appeal on sixscreensofthewatchtower.com. My wife, she also was supposed to appear for a Judicial Committee hearing. But she was sick at the time, and she could not do so. The Watchtower let her go and overturned it to some degree. So she's really not considered technically disfellowshipped here by the local Kingdom Hall. It's a refreshing thing to step outside the world of the Watchtower. Life seems different. Life doesn't seem to have the control on you. You're able to breathe and think for yourself. You're able to do things without having some organization constantly telling you what you have to do, what you're supposed to do. And the neatest thing about it all is God exists outside the watchtower.